I stumbled into having to confront my past and recognizing the connection between uh, the trauma, the anger, the hurt that I was carrying around and how that affected the way that I pursued my relationships, how I treated myself, what I felt was possible for me. Hey, this is Chad Namiro. And I'm Kelly Namiro. Welcome to the Balancing Chaos Podcast. A lifestyle podcast where we will interview guests about wellness, business, and just about everything in between. Our goal is to help you develop a lifestyle that promotes health, wholeness, and success. Through our conversations, we hope to inspire you to live a beautiful, full, and joyful life as you navigate balancing the chaos. We hope you enjoy. All right. Natalie Liu is a writer, speaker, podcaster, artist, and founder of one of the longest running self-help blogs in the world, Baggage Reclaim and the Baggage Reclaim Sessions podcast. She is British born and Ireland raised. She has now written a beautiful book, which I have in my hand called The Joy of Saying No, where she helps people understand how their emotional baggage is interfering with their ability to live their happiest life and be authentic. Her advice has been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, NPR, USA Today, the BBC, among many others. She lives in South London with her husband. She has two daughters and a cockapoo. Welcome to the show. We're really glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. We, um, as I said before we started recording, we went deep into the archives of your podcast. You've been doing this for <laughs> a while, like a good amount of time and How consistently. How long have you been doing this? Coming up to eight years. Okay. I took a uh, the best part of a year's break. Um, it's sort of in the middle of it, but yeah, about oh, coming up to eight years. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in the actual podcasting space, because now everyone wants to have a podcast. Um, how did mm. you get started in that? And what has that experience been like for you? So I, to reverse back slightly, I've had the blog, you know, the website Baggage yeah. Reclaim since September 2005. So that's like 17 wow. and a half years. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the year before I started my podcast so I guess it was like 2014 my husband comes home from work one day and he's like I really think you should get into podcasts and I said what and he's like yeah I was talking about it with this guy at work and I think this would be like a really good fit and I said like, uh. and so I remember sort of looking I wasn't really listening to I don't think I was listening to any podcast at that point mm -hmm. but it sort of niggled he has a way of of kind of saying things that you can kind of go hmm I better pay attention to that and so over a few months, I started toying with the idea, but because I am a recovering people pleaser and perfectionist, I kind of overcomplicated it. So yeah. I was worried about the sound and the tech and how many say I started the podcast with like five segments in it. Wow. I, I look back and I was like, how on earth was I doing a podcast each week with five different segments about a year after he had said that I actually went and spoke to a friend of mine's husband who is like a he's like a touring singer and he was like here borrow my recorder showed me how to do it boom yeah. podcast was up and it just took making that first one what was interesting though as I said about those five segments was that I made 80 episodes like that yeah it was 79 80 and then my dad died and so I was taking time out and I just did not have the energy to do five segments. And so I, what happened was it was just a intuitive, natural thing where I would jump on and record and it was one thing. So, and it was like just one topic. And then I was like, oh, just kind of like it like this. Yeah. <laughs> so I stumbled into that and it's, and it's uh, rolled on ever since. What do I you love think it. your your ethos of of helping people and tackling these specific issues came from, if I might ask? When I started writing Baggage Reclaim, the month before that, I had had this bit of an awakening where I realized that I had seemed to have a penchant for emotionally unavailable men. Mm -hmm. And I had thought that I was like Miss Monogamy. I love relationships because that's kind of all I seem to be chasing after. Mm -hmm. But I realized that I had issues and actually that I really didn't like myself and because I was dealing with a, an immune system disease at the time and you know I started getting help about that I stumbled into having to confront my past 
and recognizing the connection between uh, the trauma, the anger, the hurt that I was carrying around and how that affected the way that I pursued my relationships, how I treated myself, what I felt was possible for me. And at the time I had this personal blog. So I've been blogging for like almost 19 years and I had this personal blog. <laughs> it was called um, Tired of Men and Other Things That Drive a 20 something around the twist. And I I started it because I, I was moaning about like getting the tube and a way to work and crazy mm-hmm. people I was working with, but also my love life. And it wasn't just that I was tired of men. I was tired of myself because I was like complaining, why can't I meet a nice guy? And yet I was yeah. never interested in a nice guy. And mm. when I had this awakening that summer, I remember writing on my then personal blog that, you know, I, I, I had realized that I had this pattern of being involved with emotionally unavailable people that I hated myself and all this stuff. And I thought I was a weirdo. So you can imagine my surprise when I get a whole load of comments and emails from yeah. people saying, uh, you're talking about me. Yeah, like, that really resonates. Are, <laughs> yeah, They're like you are me. And I was there, well, well, this is yeah. unexpected. And that kind of prompted me to start writing, you know, t- talking out loud about what I was going through because I had to confront the anger about my parents breaking up, about how my father's my father's absence in my life, my father, mm. my step, sorry, my stepfather and my mom's chaotic relationship. Mm. You know the, the the crumbs that I had settled for. Yeah. In my very and talking out loud about that, I was. It was like it kind of flowed out of me. I know it sounds a bit a bit odd, but. I would go on and it was it's like, I'm sharing my journey and this is what I'm recognizing about myself. And bearing in mind, this is 2005. So, you know, we're not where we are now, but yeah. there's yeah. a hell of a lot of information out there. Like I, it's not like I had never looked for info before, but it was always 50 ways to please your man. Like that was kind of the solution to everything. Put like on Cosmo some sexy Magazine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put on some sexy lingerie, cook him a nice meal, light a candle, you know, <laughs> pull out the sexual positions. How is that going to solve my self-esteem problem or the (laughs) anger that I'm carrying around about my parents? Or how is that even going to fix my toxic relationship? Yeah. Um, So it was, it was, that was that I noticed these patterns. And it's funny because I was always the person that people came to and asked for advice. Mm -hmm. Even when I was like a teenager, plus I was a very nosy child. So I was very observing everybody's relationships i always knew which adults were cheating who was up to no good right and so when i started baggage reclaim it was with really the the mission was if i could help one person avoid what i had been through or i could help them get out of that then i felt like i was given back in some way because the internet had been actually really loving and supportive of me in my journey. And I was like, I'm just going to talk out loud on this stuff and hopefully somebody else can figure out their own life from this. And fast forward, here I am. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 17 and a half later. years later. Yeah. I I love like the making your mess, your message thing. I think some of the best careers come out of that. That's definitely how I came to do the stuff I do now. And so I think that's, it. it really sparks a passion when it's something that you've been through. So I think that that's fantastic. And I do really want to get into a lot of the people pleasing and perfectionism stuff, because again, Mm -hmm. something I've been through, something a lot of the women that I work with are going through. But one of the things that you said, you know, throughout this journey of yours that really stood out to me is this idea around childhood traumas kind of leading us into the things that we choose in our adult life. And so do you think that for yourself and for other people out there who are like consistently choosing the wrong partner or someone who is not, you know, going to give them the love that they feel like they actually deserve. Is that typically something like a childhood trauma, like, you know, an absent father or something like that? Like, do you see that connection? Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing is over the years, I've heard from many thousands of people who struggle to forge healthy, intimate, loving, romantic relationships. Or in fact, sometimes across the board, like 
yeah. familial friendships at work, so forth. And there is an assumption that it's because you're a child of divorce um, or you know, single parent or your parents have beaten the bejesus out of you or whatever it was. That is, is certainly going to impact. But what's been interesting is that trauma varies from person to person. Mm -hmm. And so what there are some things that we go, okay, that's definitely a trauma, but we all have different ideas of, of what impacts us, of what has caused us deep hurt, a sense of rejection, a sense of, you know, not belonging. And there are people who are wrestling with, with their relationships and they'd be like, yeah, but I don't get it. Like both my parents are at home. But if you have had experiences in childhood and then gone on into adulthood and had had more of those mm -hmm. that have essentially given you this idea that there is something not quite right about you, that you are unworthy, mm -hmm. that you need to avoid conflict, avoid criticism, avoid intimacy, that you need to try harder than others whatever it is, whatever messages that you've taken away that impact on the way that you see yourself, the way that you treat yourself is going to affect the way you forge relationships. And of course, if you've got that trauma, and it's amazing how many people are here and they're like, oh, I never, I never had any trauma in my childhood. Yeah. And then they, they start talking about it and you go, hmm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did yeah. because because they they want it to be like this tragedy, you yeah. know, this terrible thing, right? But it can. I mean, the amount of people I've heard from that their trauma is what they went through at school, mm. and that has impacted their trust levels, yeah, and how they kind of keep a distance from people so it doesn't just go into their friendships they struggle with their romantic relationships as well because they're always expecting that they're going to get dumped mm -hmm. even if this incident dates back to like when they were five right that that's extremely helpful i actually like was almost kind of like not triggered but in that moment so for us just like to share a little bit about our our personal you know relationship we dated when we were in college mm -hmm. and i also was going through an eating disorder when i was in college nice. so like like exactly like the top of the ways that you can feel like un unworthiness it's like i'm trying mm -hmm. to like change my body to you know make it perfect for other people um and i think that a lot of the stuff that i did back when we dated the first time was like people pleasing him kind of to stay in the relationship and to like make him happy or to seem like a cool girl like oh i'm cool girl like yeah. i'll do whatever you want to do and then um we got back together and I may now see more high maintenance because I worked on myself. Yeah. Like through that time, <laughs> I'm like, I like, I know what I want. I know who I am. And like, I'm not scared to like ask for it or be vulnerable. And I think it's helped our relationship so much, but um, talk to us a little bit about that, like people pleasing in relationships. We kind of touched on the trauma and like how that attracts people, but like, mm -hmm. then you get into a relationship and you're like, okay, here I am. And I've been people pleasing for, you know, a year now, but now I want to speak up for myself and I kind of can't, like, I don't want to, sh I'm scared to show my <laughs> true self. Yeah. I mean, when we think about what people pleasing is, which is where we, we essentially deprioritize our needs, expectations, desires, feelings, and opinions to put others ahead of ours. Yeah. And that's to gain attention, affection, approval, love, and validation and or to avoid conflict, criticism, oh, yes, additional stress, disappointment, loss, you know, rejection, or what we actually might term as abandonment. Now, a lot of people have internalized rather complicated messages about, for instance, romantic relationships, what it takes to be a loving partner, what it takes for a relationship to work. And so what can happen is that because somebody is already inclined to people please anyway, mm -hmm. or their hotspot of people pleasing is their romantic relationships, because often with the romantic relationships, people end up inadvertently, but also sometimes consciously either choosing partners that reflect 
you know, they're quite similar to, for instance, one or both parents or somebody key from their childhood. And, or they end up consciously or inadvertently repeating habits that they learned, you know, observed in their parents or actually even saw on TV or films or books or whatever it might be. Mm. And so then what can happen is this part, you know, we, we get into this relationship. And when you think about how we're pitched about dating, a lot of people sell themselves on trying to be like the best girlfriend, the best boyfriend, the best partner ever. Right. Yeah. And so they're just giving it their A game initially. And it's like trying to present as like the perfect partner yeah. and very agreeable. Every, everything. Yeah. yeah. Very agreeable. What do you like? I like what you like. Um, <laughs> yeah, <totally>. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to do I, I want to do what you want to do and when they're on the date and the person turns around and they're like yeah and my ex they used to do this and this the people pleaser in their minds going doo, 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 mental notes must make sure i never ever do that in our relationship so if they hear for instance uh, uh, their their date or now partner saying yeah you know my previous relationship I hate when, you know, we would argue or I hate it when they would question me about whatever. It's like, okay, note to self, don't apply any pressure. Conflict make sure avoidant. I do yeah, you know, make sure I do that. And some, <clears throat> so many people also see it as a badge of honor to never have conflict in a relationship. So it, they are super agreeable, super accommodating. <laughs> She, she does. I That's love true. the point. In. But <laughs> yeah. we, uh, what has happened is a, a lot of people have observed what's gone on in their own environments growing up. And so they're either like, right, we're going to go to town and yeah. we are going to, we are going to fight. And then others are like, oh my God, there was so much fighting that I just don't ever want to deal with any form of conflict. Mm. So what can happen is you get into the relationship and say, like, hey, I just, just need to like get the relationship. Then you get the relationship, I just need to get the engagement or whatever it is. And it's yeah. like, once you feel like you're on relatively solid footing, what some people can start to realize is, oh, I've kind of set this up where my needs are somewhat hidden in yeah. this relationship yeah and i've kind of made out like i like everything they like and that i am totally okay with doing this stuff and so for some people it can feel really quite frightening at right this particular point because it's like oh if i start to reveal my true needs you know if i start to reveal who i really am this relationship could be toast mm -hmm. now there are others and of course it depends on on how far down the road you are with this, but other people in that same situation, they they try to assert themselves more and it might be where they hit on conflict mm -hmm. because that's kind of a natural part of the unfolding of a relationship is you are supposed to disagree sometimes and you are supposed to reveal more of yourselves as part of the intimacy of the relationship. But others also discover oh hold on a second i'm relaxing into being myself and my partner just breathes a sigh of relief it's like oh you are actually real like you are human you're not this person who like never goes to the bathroom and whose face is always like perfect or who's like just always super agreeable i've heard that plenty of times where people where a partner's just like oh i was so relieved when they finally dropped their guard because yeah. it, it felt like oh i'm with this this real person because what kind of relationship can you have if you won't go there in terms of conflict when you need to? It's not having conflict for conflict's sake. Uh, you know, I I am no fan of conflict, given yeah. how, I, how I grew up. I was, you know, I was telling, telling a story the other day about how I was in, it must have been a couple of summers ago, so it was still like kind of like weird COVID-y lockdowns. Mm -hmm. We're in this ice cream place in central London, and there's a weird queuing system because you know covid we've been keeping an eye on the tables and this woman <clears throat> as soon as these people got up from the table she just basically shot in front of my friend and sat down at the table and next to my friend goes uh we've been waiting here for this table and no word of a lie it was such an instinctive thing if i could have thrown myself over the counter <laughs> in, the, in the ice cream parlor i would like it was just i i <laughs> felt myself 
like leaving Mentally, your body <laughs> yes leave my body for myself over the counter or it's like you know that um uh, that gif of um homer when he um disappears into the bush he reverses into it <laughs> yes, that yes, was me one. in that it was like this total instant like oh my god conflict and it, it was a split second thing but as soon as i noticed it i was like laughing my head off yeah but i even in my own relationship i've had to realize you have to go to town here like you have yeah. to be willing to go there but it's I, tough i love that you say that because in our relationship he said he mentioned it but like to this day like i am a recovering people pleaser like i am still mm -hmm. in our relationship conflict avoidant and like i don't want to like deal with it i just would rather like push it under the rug, like let it go. Um, and he's like, no, like if we have a conversation, like in a really, you know, thoughtful, thoughtful way. way, intentional <laughs> way, like we're going to be closer to each other. We're going to feel more connected. We're going to feel like we're on the same page more. And I, I can figure that out as we go through it and we get to the other side. But you're like, you said, like my first reaction, that's just so like innately in me is to like, like no i don't want it. it's like almost like a fight or flight response it feels like um oh it it, it totally is yeah and it, it's all about our relationship with conflict like i just did not have an ex a healthy experience of right. conflict mm -hmm. growing up yeah at all right and so it is no wonder that i am like that because you know we're together you know a long time now approaching 17 years as well and what's interesting is our relationship with conflict has evolved over time and like you chad he would say i know this is bothering you <laughs> so why don't you say like it's bothering yeah. you and it, I, it and, it's, and it's interesting because I was, I could be very childish about conflicts initially. And I was embarrassed actually at how childish I could be. I remember my, my aunts once joking about how, when I was a kid, and I had a really vague recollection of it, that when I was annoyed and I'm talking, apparently I was like three or something like this, but if I was annoyed, I would storm, I would say, and get my coaty. I had a panty, a red coat and I would storm off out of the house. Now I'd forgotten about this for a long time until my aunt brought it up and I must have been in my twenties. When they said it to me, I was like, oh my God, I could picture myself in all of my relationships, storm out of the house. Mm -hmm. That's something I've been doing apparently since I was like a toddler. And yep. so what was interesting is I, the first two times that we had a disagreement in our relationship, I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> And he was like, what the frick are you doing? Like, who, who argues like this? He says, listen, I don't know what kind of relationships you've been in before, but that is like totally not appropriate. That is not how <laughs> argue. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and I felt really like his, when he was saying that, like it, 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 the aim of it wasn't to shame me, but actually what I realized is that I respected him too much to yeah. continue on with that and I remember when I said to him like that is never going to happen again and I even found the notes that I had written to him uh you know about it like a while back and he said at the time he was like okay <laughs> you know figuring oh you know we're gonna be here again and it, obviously he was in it for the long haul but um actually I didn't do it again because what would happen is I I would get that sensation in that moment where I'm like oh. and sometimes it's like you actually you want to like, you want to get real, like in your head, you're like, yeah, I'm going to cuss this person at the time. To... And then you go, why would you, why would you go there? Cause you're, you're overstepping a line. And so over the years, when you're in that relationship, just like you two are, you end up realizing that you have, I know it's an overused term, but that safe space mm. to one engage in conflict, but two, to evolve how you engage in conflict as well. Yeah. I think the biggest fear I have, and I've seen it with a lot of people's relationships is if you don't understand how to have a healthy relationship with conflict, especially within couples or marriages, et cetera, some get to the point where they just don't even bring things up anymore because it yeah. goes nowhere. And then you're just suppressed and mm -hmm. it's, it's just it's numb at that point. Mm. And so I kind of embrace it, honestly, because I, I think the whole process is really helpful. And that's just it's what a partnership is. I think if you can 
have really differing opinions and have a fruitful discussion about it and come to a somewhat of an agreement. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and it's just something you need to do. I think in the partnership when you're raising kids and you're making all these critical decisions all the time. And so, um, yeah, it's something I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Conflict is a form of intimacy. So I'm not saying that yeah. <clears throat> oh, always have conflict for conflict's sake, but that's, you really don't know each other until you have allowed for the possibility of conflict. So it's yeah. not that you need to be in disagreement all the time, but you need to know that if you need to, that you can and mm. you will. Yeah. yeah. And I hear too many people boasting, we never argue. And I'm like, that's not a badge of honor because yeah, exactly. somebody's lying. Somebody's not telling the truth. Yeah. Somebody's not really, somebody's, probably get in their way at the expense of the other and, and because conflict is a form of intimacy if if you have not and this is where people pleasers fall afoul now is that if you if you aren't expressing yourself and so you're not for instance saying no when you need one to ensure and you are afraid to have boundaries in a relationship and maybe you're kind of being subservient or almost in it and acting like, oh, almost like a housekeeper. Some people kind of carry on like, I'm a housekeeper, yeah. I'm a babysitter, I'm a gardener, I'm the chef or, you know, the core girl or, the core, you know, core guy yeah. or whatever it is. It's like, no, that's not what your job is in the relationship. And if you have not allowed for comfort, then you, your relationship is not that intimate. You have, well, even if you've been together for 20 years, if you're not being yourself, then you have as much intimacy as somebody who was in the early stages of, yeah. of their oh, relationship. I think that so what is that? That's so powerful. And I think that like when you can recognize like what all the stuff you were saying before, like why you might be conflict avoidant because of where you came from, it allows you to have a little more compassion for yourself Amen. in order to move forward. Hey fam, if you are listening here, then you may be someone who deals with chronic overwhelm, bloating, anxiety, and weight you can't lose, maybe hair loss or skin conditions. If one of those things rings true for you, the Wellness by Kelly Health and Hormones course is available to help you get to the root cause and solve the issue in a way that's sustainable and gives you your lifestyle with lasting results. No more diets or quick fixes, but real health and vitality for the long run. My course runs through everything from what labs to test for, to what protocols to implement given what's off in your blood work. We cover a variety of hormonal imbalances and how to heal them, plus the mindset work that you'll have to do to change your habits. If you're ready for an environment where you can learn the tools and truly heal to feel your best, most aligned, light, confident version of you, then this course is for you. If you're feeling called to join the WBK Health and Hormones course, head to the link in the show notes to learn more where you'll get my membership included with your purchase. I want to talk about, because like we see, like we've talked so much about relationships, but in the women who I coach and including myself, like people pleasing is such a big thing, not only to the spouse, but it's to the all to the outside world. Like how can Absolutely. I be super mom and do all the things and do all the things for work and the kids and not let anyone down. And I want to know from your perspective, do you see that as the primary reason that so many women are burnt out? Uh, yeah, because we're trying to be like perfect women, wonder women. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be perfect mom, perfect partner, perfect spouse, perfect employee, the perfect, you know, PDA person, whatever it might be. So it, it's <laughs> like we are subscribing to this idea of what we think it is to be a good something. Right. And the thing is, is that that can feel very noble and it can tap into our good qualities. But there's a big difference between being ourselves and performing at our idea of what we think a good something is. And mm. so, for example, like I remember when, you know, my, my two girls, they're, they're teenagers now, but I was like, you know, I was involved at school, but then I was like, well, hold on a second, Natalie, like you do want to be involved at school. That's part of the reason why you work for yourself so that you've got that, that freedom, that flexibility to go there, but you don't have to also like volunteer for all the things. The thing. <laughs> and also you don't need almost as a knee jerk reaction to your own childhood, try to overcompensate for that and try to be perfect or at least better than 
your own parents. Mm. And so uh, I think a big moment for me was one day my my youngest was just being a nightmare with homework. <laughs> and it was going on and on. And you know, just when you just like, give me a break. And it was just dragging on and on. And of course, just kids. Yeah. Homework. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I was like, oh, for goodness sake. And I was like, ah! just, and I, I was just like frustrated. And then I promptly burst into tears. And my daughter was looking at me like, what? And I realized <laughs> that the reason why I burst into tears is because I'm like, oh my God, I'm turning into my mom. <laughs> and I really had to look at myself because, okay, not my greatest moments, right? Yeah. However, one, it doesn't make me my mom because like I, we sometimes experience physical punishment when we got something wrong with homework or when we weren't doing stuff on time. It was, and that's, I mean, when you think of the things that so many of us went through when we were kids and what our parents would say or do or teach us or whatever, just a totally different time. Mm. But I also recognize, I also don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater as if my experience of being mothered is so terrible that I have to totally overcompensate for that and be this pristine mother. Because then I was feeling like tired and resentful because mm. I'm sort of undoing the housework. Like I'm trying to keep a perfect house mm -hmm. and I'm trying to be like a perfect in work and perfect. In it's too much. And I think a lot of women struggle with it. One, because we have less margin to say no. Right. Yeah. So, Men and women, all of us humans, we are all to some degree socialized into people pleasing, right? Totally. But what men receive messages about what it is to please others. And it can be, you know, you must be hyper masculine, you know, don't show emotions, make sure you are the man of the house, you are boss, you are in charge, you know, all this type of stuff. Don't be a sissy. What are you crying for? What are you doing? That's very effeminate, isn't it? So the be a good little boy in whatever version that okay. is. But because we are all in this patriarchal system, the messages that men receive, even though it's, it's still problematic and it is still basically tapping into the people pleasing, it ends up still facilitating them having more power, having more agency. Whereas the messages that women and girls receive is like, be sweet, be meek, be mild, don't be rude, don't talk out of turn, cross your legs, don't be a slut, don't be this, don't be that. And of course, depending on where you are in the world, you may have way less margin than, than you or I do, for instance, Kelly. So yeah. we end up receiving messages that limit our agency because that's the systems that we've grown up in. And mm -hmm. It can feel scary as a as a girl or a woman to say no in certain situations because it can literally feel life or death. You know, something I've said recently, you know, with Prince Harry's autobiography coming out and everybody's like, oh, my God. But actually, it just tells us about our societal discomfort with people saying no and drawing a line. Mm. But one of the things I've noticed is that actually it also highlights about who is allowed to say no. And so... A man can say no, for instance, at work, because then it's seen as, oh, that's a power move. But if a woman says no in the same context, it's like, <sighs> difficult. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, if we think about the whole thing of romantic relationships, and we speak specifically about heteronormative relationships, the guy gets to be like, I like you. I choose you to be in a in a relationship or, or I choose you to give a wedding ring to. But if that same woman turns around who's involved and says, actually, I'm not interested in you. Oh, my gosh. Like for some men, it's like the end of the world. Yeah. It's like, how dare you yeah. say, say no to me? So it's so like this true. whole thing. Is who gets to say no? And I think because of these messages that we've received about what we are and aren't allowed to do we are all struggling with oh. i know but i think a lot of women are burning out you know i'm 45 i grew up in a women can have it all and and all of a sudden it was okay for me to go to university and have a job but also i needed to be in a relationship too i, I realized i don't know within a year of being in at work uh if this is what having it all is like <laughs> yeah i don't want it <laughs> it was exhausting it's so true. And I think that's like, you even go to like 
it's fr- from your parents, from mo- the movies, from like, and then you even go to like what you were saying, like you go, you'll go to like a cocktail party and people are like, so you guys are married. And then the next question is like, when are you going to have a kid? And then when are you going to have oh, another yes. kid? And it's like, all there's so much pressure all the time. And I think that that's why it like the pressure to be perfect. And then it's like the pressure to subscribe to those norms that you're talking about or like the expectations that people have. And so one of the things you said is like, this idea of being perfect and like us trying to live up to that versus our idea of like what we really want for ourselves. How do you start to, and I know people read the book, I'm sure they're going to get tons of answers to that, but how, how do you start to differentiate that so that you can say no to the things that actually you want to say no to, or say yes to the things that are really truly aligned with you versus trying to project that perfection out to the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that there's a few things that you can really sort of notice that let you know where you are people pleasing and where, even if it contains an element of you, that you're doing what can appear to be good thing, but for the wrong reasons, because it's the intention Mm. behind it that create, that makes it people pleasing. Like lots of people want to, I don't know, help out people, stay behind at work, whatever it might be. But they don't do it because they're afraid that if they don't do it, something terrible is going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it because they are trying to compensate for underlying feelings of low self-worth. They're not doing it because they're like, well, if I do this, then maybe I'm going to get this back in Mm -hmm. return. And so things to look out for is it's like, I should, I must, I can't. Where is that coming from? Because we often have these hard and fast rules about how we're supposed to be going about doing things. And when we notice that we're thinking and acting and talking and feeling in that way, that we can go, is that actually true? true? And and not just true, is this actually true for me? Mm. I think also it's important to notice where you're experiencing what I call the people pleaser feelings, which, uh, which include like guilt, anxiety, resentment, frustration, overwhelmed, feeling overloaded, uh, low helplessness, powerlessness, those types of feelings are an indicator that even if you thought it was a good thing, you have said yes to something for the wrong reasons. And when I say you've said yes, you may have directly, very consciously said yes, or you may have gone along with something, or you may just remain silent. And that was taken as you saying yes. So notice where you are having those feelings or notice where you, you know, like sometimes people ask you Mm. for something or to do something and outwardly you go, yeah, sure. No problem. Inwardly. I can't believe that beep, beep, beep in your head. (laughs) You're saying all of this stuff or you're already (gasps) mentally working out. How am I going to get out of this? Yes. You know, you outwardly you've got, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll be there. Inwardly you're going, oh my God, I totally have to get out of this. So you're trying to mentally shuffle your calendar, trying to work out what your perfect excuse will be. Notice when you're doing that. Notice as well when you are asked, for instance, to do something and in your head you're going, oh, but if I if I don't do this, people are going to judge me. People are going to think whatever, because these are all signs that you actually don't want to do the thing or that you need to find a better reason to do the thing. And I think that when you start to notice these, these can give you clues about where your people pleasing is showing up in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I encourage people to get to know their pleaser. But also, I'll give an example. And I know there'll be many women listening who can identify with this. You may, for instance, have this notion of being a good mother or a good employee or a good partner or whatever it might be. But there may be a difference between that and what your actual priorities and values are. So for instance, you might be like, I'm trying to be a good employee, but you also really value your personal time. Maybe you want to spend time with your children or with your partner and you don't want to be working all hours. And yet it's your day off and you're working and you've got other things that you want to be doing. Maybe you want to be relaxing, but actually you are hunched over your laptop or huddled up with your grocery shopping in the car, taking another call, trying to sort out something. And you are taking those calls and doing those things because it's like, oh, well, that's what a good employee does. But that is putting you at odds with who you say you are and what your priorities are. 
And also because if you're exhausted mm -hmm. and you have no time to yourself, is that actually how you want to live your life? Like, do you want to be burnout? Do you want to be feeling like the slightest thing could tip you over the edge? Right. And so when you notice those differences, and, and in the in the book, I, I, I talk about this as one of the steps is notice the difference between desire, you know, make it a desire or say no. So notice the difference between desire and obligation. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like you have to do? What do you feel like you're obliged to do? And what do you actually want to do? Because if you don't actually want to do it, then you definitely should be saying no, or you need to be having an honest conversation. And the funny thing is, is that for a lot of people, when they have that choice, when you say to them, okay, you feel like it's an obligation. Okay. Talk to the person about it. I feel like I have to do this particular thing. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk about it. Then say no. I think that's really helpful. Um, Maybe just diving into the book a little bit because i think it's it's fascinating tell us kind of perhaps quickly about these five different types of of people pleasers so people can maybe identify, self -identify which right. one they may be yeah. i mean probably everyone is one of them to an extent i would think mm. so the five styles of people pleasing are gooding efforting avoiding saving and suffering so the names in and of themselves I'll start to give hints about what what you tend to do. So you're trying to be good or look good. Mm -hmm. You're very much about effort, you know, being the best, trying the hardest, being perfect, giving 100%. Yeah. And then it might be that your style is avoiding, as in you're avoiding anything that you think will create the even the slightest discomfort for others. So it's like, oh, well, I'll just never bring that thing up. And then I'll, you know, I'll make sure I keep everything hunky-dory. You know, if, if if your life is totally about avoiding conflict, <laughs> you're in the avoiding. Yeah. And then saving as, you know, the helpers, fixers, savers, saviors of this world who their way of making themselves feel good is through what they do for others. So they have an element maybe of, of the gooding and the efting, but it's all about help fixing, saving, and then suffering, uh, you know, some people feel like the more you suffer, the better it makes you as a person. And, and, and so they, so they think, well, I bleed for you. I, I, I busted up my boundaries for you. Now will you love me? Now will you do what I want? And what these five styles are really about as well is recognizing what drives you so that you can recognize where your people pleasing shows up because as the name suggests, you're driven by being good or you're driven by effort or you're driven by avoiding or wanting to help or, yeah, being in pain. And this can help you to recognize where that people pleasing is showing up because awareness is the key. This is what I've heard from so many people about this is that they thought being a people pleaser was like being a doormat or that it was a badge of honor. And that when they are aware of these styles of people pleasing or just their intentions, like noticing their weird whys and, and where they're sometimes telling people what they think they want to hear. They're like, oh, that's the people pleasing. And then they can consciously choose to do something else instead. Yeah. So that's, I'm guessing, I was going to ask you right after the, that, like all of those styles, because I think that people do... I mean, coming from somebody who as their job gives people advice, people do really mm. well with like a tangible small step, right? And I know you mm -hmm. have a ton of those in the book. Everybody go out and get Natalie's book because I think that, like I said, I think it could serve everybody. But if you could give everybody, like the listeners, one small step that they could take, is it like to try to say no to one thing? Is it, what, like what's the small step to move away from what they don't want to feel anymore? So I think the small step is actually the noticing. Mm -hmm. So you can't know you can't know what your people pleasing is or what to say no to if you don't actually notice how you're spending your yes, mm. no's and maybes in the first place. So when you just it's like that little bit of extra few seconds to notice, oh, I feel a bit funny around that particular person. Or oh my gosh, when I see their name come up on my phone. I'm like dreading, you know, or 
<laughs> that's that's why I say that first step is get to know your pleaser. But it is that first step to saying no, because otherwise look, a lot of people, they think, oh, I'll just read the book, leap out of bed tomorrow, tomorrow morning and just fire off all of these no's. <laughs> and then life will just be <laughs> fantastic and sunshine and my little ponies. And we all know that that's not the way that it's going to be. So instead, it's that noticing and how our lives can change so much by noticing the content of our lives. So notice where are those funny feelings showing up? Yeah. That's a great first step because then you're going to get clues to where you can say no and take better care of yourself. I love it. Would you say the same is true? I'm guessing it is around conflict. I'll, I'll give an example. I think we're both like <laughs> zero to hundred type people. So like <laughs> we'll go from zero to a hundred real fast. Um, I'll tend to, go on offense and she'll tend to go on defense, like yeah. you know, more defensive in terms of like your argumentative style, I would say. Uh, and I feel like if you just took a couple moments and understood how quickly that just went from zero here to zero. here, mm-hmm. you might be a little bit more thoughtful and, and um, you know, just, just diligent about how you uh, not avoid the conflict, but, but move through it and come to a conclusion. Oh yeah. It's that, it's, you know, it's that power of the pause. Like it's funny. We know if we're honest with ourselves, we know actually when we are close to a conflict situation because there's certain sensations that we get in our body. Mm-hmm. You know, you know when you're being well, unreasonable you, too, because you're like, yeah, I can't yeah, you do. That. Like, and, <laughs> and, and, and you're in a relationship long enough, you know, this person, like myself, my husband, it's not that we argue all the time, but it's funny on those occasions when we do argue, I just know it's on the way. Like he would say, I just, he feels like I start to get like a bone, you know, yeah. between, between my teeth. You want to and do it. <laughs> he feels, yeah, he's like, well, you just won't drop it because I'll be like, well, no, let's just talk. And he'll be like, hold on a sec. He's now realizing, oh, we're about to get into an argument because he's <laughs> he's set he's set the stage and he's poked. Yeah. And yeah. Then I'm like, okay, fine. We'll do this. And then he's like, oh, I've actually poked and he's like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm like, no, actually, I need you. And, he's, and then he gets really annoyed that I still want to, to go at that. But yeah. what's interesting is you do notice what are your hot button topics? Family is that one. It tends to be, you know, like big family events, you know, or the mothers. Those are hot button subjects for mm-hmm. us. Uh, you know, when you're overtired as well. And you kind of get that perfect stomach conditions. But yeah. if when you you know when you're being reasonable, you know that kind of it's different to the normal conversations that you have. Yeah. Because you start to say or do certain things. And I think that if we're aware of these things, it doesn't mean that we won't argue. But you know, like I, sometimes in my head, I'm going, no, nah, just just leave it be. And sometimes I do, and then sometimes I'm like, it just says one more thing, and I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 it's yeah. so true. Um, going back to a little bit earlier, kind of talking about the idea of like saying no and and people pleasing and boundaries, can we, you know, we're all like, not all, but else I'm not, that's generalizing, but most of us are on that edge of the spectrum that it's like, we got to say no to some more stuff so we can not Mm -hmm. burn out so that we can, um, feel like we have more intimate relationships so that we can feel like we're being our authentic selves. But can we ever get to the opposite end of the spectrum where it's like, we're not really doing anything for other people. Um, and like, we're too involved, like self-involved, or do you feel like that's really not in, in this world, like a, a, a capacity? No, that's a, I would say it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, I mean, it, it is the great fear that a lot of people have, which actually tells us a lot about what we associate with no, that a lot of people are like, oh my God, so is this going to tell me like to a really selfish person? Is this yeah. going to tell me like to an ass clan, something like that, you know? <laughs> and you're like, I-, I think that when we go the total opposite way, we think that that's about boundaries, but that's actually about anger and defense and self-protection. Cause it's like, I don't trust anyone. Mm. So I'm just going to kind of close myself off and just be like, right, it's all about me. And that's not the same as being boundary. And sometimes that's a space that that people have to go through. Like before I kind of entered into this phase of my journey, I went through, I guess I must have been realizing that I was frustrated 
with certain things. And so I, all of a sudden I was like, ah, nah, nah, nah. And it's almost I like self, self-protection almost because you've been yeah. through so much of people maybe like walking all over you or like, like you not voicing your opinion. And then it's like, okay, now I need to like yeah. overstep. And then we yeah. get back into a place of balance. Exactly. I think some, I think what happens sometimes is that people feel like, oh my God, I've just realized I have not been saying no, I've not been having boundaries. <laughs> I need to make up for last time. And so what, what ends up happening is they end up sometimes, okay, sometimes it's for the people that they've had that struggle with, but sometimes they just focus it on random people and are like, right, well, you're going to get it because yeah. you're next in line. And I've now decided that I'm going to say no. And, and to be fair, I think that this can be part of the process. Like I say to people, if you're waiting to say no perfect, Perfectly and to kind of create your boundaries perfectly good luck with that yeah because actually it is trial and error sometimes you're going to say the wrong thing you know i say to people if if your sentence has the word boundaries in it you're probably not being that boundaries so if you're like my boundaries are <laughs> you're, not, you're probably not being that boundaries because the, the thing that i try to get across to people is we are our boundaries so our boundaries are as much about what we say yes to as they are about no. We, we're, we're the living embodiment of our boundaries. Mm -hmm. If I say to you, what's your name? And you're like, Kelly and Chad. And I turn around and go, oh, hey, Cal and C. But you never <laughs> told me I could call you Cal and C. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, maybe you won't mind, but at the end of the day, if I, I don't know, call you something completely different that, and I'm like, ah, I'm going to call you Cassandra and I'm going to call you Charlie. <laughs> That's me overstepping a boundary. Yeah. There, that's just, this is that's a simple. It's a, a simple way of showing boundaries. So, I do think that there are, as a, you're right, there are some people who I think are like, oh. But I also think, actually, in the world that we live in, where far too many of us are far too compliant, it can feel uncomfortable to us to be around people who are like, no, I'm not doing that. Because it's like, well, why won't you just be a bit more compliant and accommodating? Yeah. And we feel uncomfortable with that because it, it it makes us go, but I'm always saying yes to stuff and being accommodating. So I think that I I think for most people, it's not really a concern unless you go into the real anger zone. Okay. That's super And you'll helpful. come out the other side of that. Yeah. Mm. Um. So I don't want to, you know, exclude Chad from this conversation. And I want you to chime in <laughs> and like, tell us what you think. But one of the things that you brought up, Natalie, was that this idea of like women, obviously, we tend to have that projection onto us from a very young age of like, be sweet, don't say, you know, don't be rude, be polite, that all that kind of stuff. And then as we grow into some of us mothers, some of us working women, it for some reason for us, it becomes harder to put ourselves first. Um, mm -hmm. And we tend to value what everybody else needs before we start to value our own needs. Mm. So can you tell us, is, do you, is, I mean, do you see that as the case? Like you said, most of the time, and if so, how do women start to own their own value a little bit more so that they can start to put themselves first with everything that has to be on your t their to-do list. Do, I mean, do you feel that way or do you feel, I want to know, like, I want to hear from you too. Yeah, me and my own. Like, do you feel like women are, I don't want to put us in a box, but like we tend to feel like we have to take care of everybody else. And like, I feel like you kind of are like there, when there's something you want to do, you kind of just, just chill and do it. I don't know if I'm you sound like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm qualified, so I'll be sensitive here. But uh, I think that our society greatly lauds and uh, approves of super moms and super mom mentality. Yeah, it's the idea mm. that you're doing everything and that you're taking care of all of it, and that's viewed as like the perfect mom and, and now there's a lot of constructs around like being the ceo and the mom at the same time and doing you know three other things and so yeah i think it's mostly societal um mm -hmm. one of the things i had to notice myself was like where i was even judging other women 
for like Ooh, yeah. certain things. Um, and like validation. That what? Like, oh, she does that. Like, yeah. so it's possible, but it's like, it's Instagram. It's not real. That and also where I would be like, I, I use this example a lot, but like we, our younger one wasn't sleeping through the night for a really long time. He like, and so he was like seven or eight months and I, I was judging other women who had a night nurse. I was like, I'll never do that. That's they're like, you know, they're lazy. They're, you know, they don't want to be with their mm -hmm. kids. And like, when I took a step back and I was like, wait a second, like if I did this one night a week or something like that for myself, like it would let me show up better for the kids. I'd be less reactive. I would be better at mm -hmm. work because I wouldn't be so exhausted all the time. Yeah. Um. So I had to look at some judgments that I had too, but, and that helped me kind of start to value myself and, and do something that would be caring for myself. But how can women start to start value themselves rather than always putting everybody else before themselves? So I, I think that's what we often feel uncomfortable admitting is that we can be very entrenched in these ideas about what it is to be, you know, a Wonder Woman, Super Mom, Super CEO, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we can be very uncomfortable in recognizing that there is resentment there mm -hmm. because that resentment is often accompanied by exhaustion and tension and overwhelm and guilt and the the other people who please are feelings. And so it's one thing if we can hand on heart say, I am like so super happy with my life. And I'm so super happy with the way that I am being and all of these things I'm taking on. Obviously the overwhelming majority uh, of people who are trying to do it all, be it all, have it all, are not. Mm -hmm. And if you can recognize these feelings, that can act as a signpost to help you be a bit more honest about all of the things that you feel that you have to do. Mm. I, I would encourage anybody who's like trying to do all this stuff and say, well, I have to do this, or I can't believe that they do that. Why? Get out a piece of paper. What are all the things that I feel that I have to do? Well, I got to keep a perfect home and I got to make sure that you know, the bathroom's done X amount of times a week and I'm not going to have a cleaner for this because, well, I should be doing it myself. I should be able to juggle it all. Yeah. Whatever all of those is. And then be like, look through that list because that's a lot to be carrying around on you. How much of that, and this goes back to what we said earlier, how much of that is actually true? So something that I had this eye-opening moment a couple of summers ago where our youngest had because of the pandemic had experienced anxiety and, mm -hmm. and OCD. And so we had got her extra support. And part of that was that we did these six sessions of family therapy, which was to, for them to help us understand what she was going through, but also to help her understand what the entire family had gone through, you know, as all of this was going on. So part of that was, you know, she was asking, oh, tell, tell each of you tell me about the other and that type of stuff. And one, there was this moment <laughs> in it where I realized that I had, we had succeeded in giving our children the normal happy childhood that we had sought out for our children. But I also had this realization that one, I was the one with the jacked up childhood and and also that it was only me that cares about the house being like super tidy and not even super tight, but like, I, it's only me losing my mind over that. I, I Something was said and I suddenly realized it's like, Natalie, you are the one imposing your standards on everybody else mm. and then losing your mind over it because either they don't care as much about it or you're exhausted from trying to keep up with all of these things. And I remember sitting there and she was saying whatever and they were laughing about something. And I was like, Natalie, it's only you that cares about this. And when I was reflecting on that, my, my mom was obsessive about the house growing up. So I think that somewhere along the way, I picked up some of those things. And I was like, oh, well, I've got to be doing it. And I've yeah. had to release myself from some of these standards because I value being in my bed super early or being relaxed or not losing it with everybody you're banging the vacuum cleaner around the place of oh why can't you put 
I actually value like that sort of connectivity. Yes, I still like things to be relatively tiny, but I don't want it to control. I don't want to use that to control myself or to control others. Mm. And so it was making these realizations like, oh, I'm trying to please some unrealistic standard of motherhood. And when I can, when you can have these moments of realization and go, why am I doing this? Like ask yourself, why am I doing this? Mm. Like, why am I exhausting myself for work or motherhood? Do your kids want you to be exhausted? Do you even want to be exhausted? What can you let go of in all of this? Yeah. I think that that's the whole thing is what I, my thing is when you realize that you're exhausted or you're pissed off or whatever it might be, first thing you need to look at, what do I need to say no to? Yeah. As soon as you can let go of some things, you will start to relinquish yourself from these unrealistic expectations. And what you discover, if you give yourself more than a hot minute, the sky doesn't fall down when you do a bit less. It really doesn't. I think the most yep. powerful, like important thing that you said there is that there's going to be, I think that what people don't really recognize is, and it's sitting there right in front of you, but I think that what a lot of us don't really recognize is that there's going to have to be something that you're willing to give up or something that you're going to have, have to be willing to let go of or relinquish control on if you want to have the feeling that you want to have, whether it's peace or connection or like more of whatever the thing is, there has to mm -hmm. be something that's going to take it. So it's, if it's the tidiness of the house, like, okay, like be okay with that. It's going to be a little uncomfortable at first, but the more yeah. that you get the other thing that you want, like that connection with your kids or not feeling exhausted when you wake up the next day, it's like, damn, that's actually really worth it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned about when your son wasn't sleeping that well. Yeah. And when, when our eldest was about, I don't know, probably four and a half, five months old, went through that phase, you know, when they're kind of getting ready to start like weaning and so they kind of, their mm -hmm. sleeping gets really erratic and the breastfeeding wasn't enough. And I just went through this week or two where I felt like this really bad mom for considering introducing formula into it. Now, if somebody had said that I would be like that six months before, I'd have been like, Pfft. But you know what had happened? I'd been in this mom and baby group mm. where it was like, how long have you been breastfeeding for? How much does your baby weigh? Is your baby sleeping? Blah, 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 blah. And then I heard myself, like I was crying one day about it. My husband was looking at me like, what? are you on crack? <laughs> like, why? Why would you be? And, but I was holding myself like, oh my gosh, how, how much of a failure am I that I'm considering introducing formula at this point and I'm not going to exclusively breastfeed like for however long. And I heard myself and I was like, this is not you. And the moment that I acknowledged that, boom. It was easy. I, yeah. you know, yeah, that's easy. That's a big one. That that one specifically yeah. is how long have you breastfed and it's it deemed as so like selfish pressure. If if you can't, you know breastfeed for a certain amount of time and then there's like these heroic figures so they claim often that they've done it for like two three years etc it's like when an uber driver always tells you about a side business because he's somewhat ashamed to be an uber driver <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> oh my gosh that is spot on that oh, yeah. is totally spot on <laughs> yeah yeah oh uh, so natalie thank you so much this conversation is going to be so helpful everybody go out and get natalie's book the joy of saying no and subscribe to her podcast the baggage reclaim um and her sessions and her um her blog baggage reclaim so thank you can, where can everyone find you and the book so social media wise i'm on really's instagram i'm okay. at nat lu n-a-t-l-u-e on there the book is available like at all the kind of the, the places you know amazon barnes and noble apple books uh kind of forgetting some bookshop.org and of course in independent booksellers as well and yeah please if you can and love it if you go out and buy the book Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. It, it, this was such a great conversation. And there's so many more like beautiful nuggets in the book of taking back your own power and being your authentic self and being able to say no to the things that you don't want to do. So thank you, Natalie. I am so grateful for your time. We are. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to hang out with you both. Thank you yeah. so much. 
We really hope that you enjoyed that episode. You can follow me on Instagram at Wellness by Kelly. And if you're new around here, you can sign up for the WBK seven day free trial where you can get access to all of my low impact workouts, blood sugar balancing, plant based recipes, and guided meditations, all available on wellnessbykelly.com and on the WBK app. Hey, thanks for listening. Please make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also connect with us on social media at Wellness by Kelly. Drop us a DM for who you want to hear from. 